it's one thing to talk about the effects of the Santa Fe Trail in the environments that it passed through on the plains, but then there were also this kind of ripple effect that happened in the environment where the trail ended, for example, in New Mexico. The route of the trail was affected by the topography of the landscape. So that's one reason the trail goes where it does through Pecos, is because you have Glorieta Pass, which is this uh, low point between the eastern uh, plains and then the Rio Grande Valley. Pecos National Historical Park is kind of a, is a very, very special place in that wagon trains would basically go in the easiest passage that they could find. Now as you neared the Glorieta Pass, these wagon trains began to basically funnel or began to kind of consolidate into what would be considered a corridor. It's an easy passage, stays open all year round, very, very rarely ever gets snowed in for any length of time, stays at that 7,000 foot elevation. People have been passing through the Pecos area for centuries upon centuries. Uh, the Santa Fe Trail uh, went directly along the Glorieta Creek and the, the Pecos ruins were a nice little side shoot or side venture and so if, when folks would visit Pecos Pueblo during the Santa Fe Trail time, they would be leaving the creek bed for only a couple of hours. What proximity to water really dictated where you know, each and every one of these historical features are located. So we're here standing here at Pigeons Ranch, which is a stage stop and ranch operated by Alexander Valle during the time of the, or at the height of the Santa Fe Trail. The proprietor of this particular establishment is trying to capture any and all travelers to go right through the center of his establishment. We look around today and we see the, the forested mesa behind us and uh, over in the mountains. But back then, much of this forest would have been uh, cut down, and especially along the Santa Fe Trail because folks, just like today, they wanted to stay warm, they wanted to cook their meals, and so over time, over the 60 years of the Santa Fe Trail, there were a lot of people using the resources in this area. This building that we're at right now uh, was Koslowski's stage stop and he constructed this um, upon his arrival out here in 1858 and this became a, a popular stop along the Santa Fe Trail. A project uh, was funded for cocha weed which is invasive into archaeological structures, underground archaeological uh, sites and that's a, in and of itself, you'd think of it as a natural resource project, but no, you know, of course, it's affecting the cultural resource. There are the, uh, the, the sites themselves, you know, so I always think of visitors with their, their guidebook in their hand, they're looking down, looking at the sketch, looking up, looking down, looking up, looking down, but then what are they doing? They're looking all around, and they're taking in the cultural landscape, and Figuring it out based on that, um, I think that it, uh, for most visitors, it's just awe-inspiring. Uh, we're a small park, so it's hard for me as a cultural resource manager to put in a project without thinking of the ramifications for natural resources. And more and more, uh, they're asking us at the park level to be thinking about uh, resources in an integrated fashion.